In this video, we're going to take a look at the x86 processor architecture and just get a high level understanding of the way that the processor works and generally the way that it communicates with different pieces of hardware on our computer. We want to understand generally how things are fetched from memory, how we actually execute instructions, and just generally what is happening inside of the processor as it continues to function on our computer. So we're going to start off by taking a look at a diagram of what the actual processor looks like in relation to other pieces of hardware. So you can see I've got three blocks here. I've got the CPU, I've got the memory, and I've got I.O. devices. Now, I, I put one I.O. device. In reality, there could be many different I.O. devices, as you no doubt know. Things like monitors, keyboards, mice, these sorts of things are I.O. devices. So in reality, that I.O. device block sort of repeats over and over and over. There's a whole bunch of them on the system. Uh, but generally, there's usually just one CPU and one set of memory. Uh, there might be multiple CPUs, but we're going to keep things as simple as possible and say there's one CPU, one memory, and um, some amount of I.O. devices. Now the CPU has a lot of different components to it. It's got an ALU, which is an arithmetic logic unit. It's got a control unit, it's got a clock, it's got registers. We're gonna talk about all of those in a lot more detail as we continue on here. But what I wanna focus on here is just generally the ways that the CPU is communicating with the memory and the IO devices. And you'll see that the way that this is happening is we have these different lines that are connecting up to each of these different devices. And there's three main things called buses that are handling the communication. There's the control bus, the address bus, and the data bus. Now I want you to understand what each of these buses is doing. So the control bus is used to help to synchronize all of the actions between all of the devices that are attached to the bus. It helps us understand you know, where we're reading and writing and what we're interacting with at the given time, and it just helps keep everything synchronized. The address bus helps to hold the address of instructions and data that are being transferred between the CPU and memory and any of the other different devices. You can think of it as sort of like a pointer. It points to the different locations where things are going to be moved. So it's helping us to understand where we're working in the actual sort of scheme of the different hardware devices. And then the data, bus, the data bus is actually going to handle the transfer of instructions and data between the CPU, memory, and uh, in terms of I.O. devices as well. Um, oftentimes, the I.O. devices actually exist on a sort of separate bus, which is, the IO which is an I.O. bus. It sort of handles all the input and output portions. But just for simplicity, I put them all inside of a data bus to make things just like a simple vision of that. So this is the way that things are working. Basically, these buses are allowing us to communicate with the different pieces of hardware that exist on the system. And in understanding that, we can sort of focus in on the CPU since it's going to be the core thing that we are working with. Um, although memory, of course, plays an important role as does IO devices sort of later down the line. So the CPU has the following components. It's got a high frequency clock, it's got a control unit, an arithmetic logic unit, and some storage locations known as registers. Let's break down each of these. Uh, the arithmetic logic unit is simply a part of the CPU that carries out logic and arithmetic. It does operations like add, subtract, and, or, not. These types of logical operations and arithmetic operations are handled by the arithmetic logic unit. So it's basically a special part of the CPU that does all of the calculations that are needed by it. We then have our memory registers, and our memory registers are basically a type of computer memory that is very close to the CPU. And it's the fastest possible memory for us to access. So the memory registers are always going to be the fastest memory. We will always try to store things in memory registers before we store them external in things like RAM and that sort of uh, memory. So memory registers are fast storage that actually exist in the CPU itself. Now the clock is very interesting. I have an image here of what the clock looks like. It basically cycles between being off and being on. So it goes between zero and one. And basically the cycle continues at a very consistent frequency. And you can see that we've sort of labeled on this image the one cycle. And the one cycle is when we drop from one to zero. So the time between each drop from one to zero is going to give us a single cycle of the clock. The goal of this is that we are able to synchronize between the CPU and the bus using this internal clock. So basically this clock is going to tick at a constant rate and every single time that it ticks, we are going to do some sort of operation. So something happens on every single clock tick. So it just makes sure that everything keeps flowing at a consistent rate. It's kind of like the heartbeat, right? So every single time the heart beats, something is happening. We're keeping things flowing in the system itself. 
And we're going to measure this typically in what's known as oscillations per second. So you have probably heard about processors with gigahertz speed. So like one gigahertz, for instance, that would be a billion oscillations per second. So just think about the scope of that. It's absolutely incredible, right? One billion oscillations every single second is a, a huge amount of time, right? This is why computers are able to run so fast and handle so much because they're doing billions and billions of operations every single second. So it's rather incredible to think about that. So the main role of the CPU clock, as I mentioned, is to synchronize things. So it's able to ensure that things are running consistently and synchronized between the different components. In helping with this is the control unit. The control unit is basically a component of the CPU that is able to decode instructions and it's able to direct operations to other units. So it can direct things to memory, to the arithmetic logic unit, to IO. The control unit, as the name suggests, controls things. It's able to look at an instruction and determine what needs to be done with it. So with all of these different components together, the CPU is able to execute various instructions in order to do things, whatever we want it to really. So whatever we tell it to do, it's able to do it because of these main components. Now, when we're talking about instructions, every instruction is something that we want the CPU to do. And there's a predefined set of steps that happen each time that we execute an instruction. And these steps are the following. What we do is we start by fetching an instruction from a queue of instructions that are available for us. We're gonna take that instruction and we're going to decode it through our control unit. And what we're gonna do is we're going to take a look at what we need to do with it and if there are any operands involved. So as an example, suppose that you have an instruction that says, I wanna to add together two numbers. The operands would be the two numbers that you're adding together. So if those operands are involved, we need to fetch those operands from the memory or registers where they are contained. So we get the data and then we put it in and then we execute the instruction and we update any status flags that are required. So, you know, if something happened during the execution, we, um, you know, update status to say, you know, that these specific events happened, you know, maybe there was a carry in the addition, for instance, maybe the addition resulted in zero. These sorts of things would be things that might get updated in status flags. And then what we do is we store the result if it's required. Right. So uh, for instance, again, if we add two numbers together, we might want to store the results somewhere. So that last step is going to store those results somewhere. And we call this a fetch decode execute procedure. And this is the general way that most CPUs are going to work. They're going to fetch an instruction, they're going to decode it, they're going to execute it, and then they're going to potentially store the result if needed. So that's the general way that instructions are actually executed on your CPU. And that's what's happening consistently as you're running programs through your CPU itself. Now, as we're doing this, we may actually need to read from memory. And there's a lot of different areas in memory where we might want to read. We might really read from registers or we might want to read from things like RAM, right? When we want to access data from RAM, this is actually a slow process. It's slower than register access because of the fact that it requires a number of different steps. So when you read from memory, what you do is you take the address that you want to read. So say that something exists at address, uh, let's say 100, it's at address 100. What we do is we say, okay, I want to read address 100. We put that onto the address bus because that's telling us the location that we want to read. And then what we do is we do something called asserting the processor's RD pin. So what we're doing is we're setting a pin on the CPU to say, I now want to read from memory. So we're telling the CPU, I want to read from memory. We put the address that we want to read onto the bus. And then what we do is we wait for one clock cycle until the memory responds to us. So we wait for that one clock cycle, the memory responds, and then we copy that data from the data bus to the destination. This should help you understand a little bit more about the bus and clocks role and everything. So basically what's happening here is the address bus says where we want to write. When we set the pin, we're essentially saying that we want to read data. So we're telling you what we want to do with that address. And then we set that off, the memory actually responds back and it sends the data back on the data bus, which handles all the data transmission, right? Each of these steps that's happening here takes one clock cycle to execute. So to place the address takes one clock cycle, changing the RD pin takes a clock cycle, and then we wait a clock cycle for memory, and then copying the data from the data bus takes a clock cycle as well. Now they might take a little bit longer than one clock cycle, but we can say generally around one clock cycle is what it's going to take. 
Now, if we compare that to register access, when we register, when we get data from the registers, we don't need to, you know, you work with the address bus. We don't need to set any pins. We don't need to do anything like that. We can direct access, which only takes one clock cycle on average. So you can see that it's about four times as slow to read from RAM as it is to read from registers. So that gives you a bit of context towards why we care about registers and why memory is maybe not as fast as what we would hope it is. Now, in knowing that memory is not as fast as what we would expect it to be, we typically use caching to help to reduce read and write time from memory. So basically, when we read and write from memory, we store the data in the cache if we think it's going to be you know, consistently read or written to, and then we are able to access from somewhere closer than the actual RAM itself. And in x86, there's actually two different levels of caches typically. Um, there's a level one cache, which is stored on the CPU. So it's actually in the CPU, much like registers, which makes it very fast. Then there's a level two cache, which is stored outside of the CPU, and it's accessed by a high-speed bus. So it's got this high-speed connection to it. It's able to be accessed quite quickly. It's a little bit slower than level one, a little bit slower than registers, but it's still faster than RAM. And we actually construct this using a special kind of RAM, which is known as static RAM. Your typical type of RAM on your computer is known as dynamic RAM, and it needs to be refreshed constantly to keep the data actually updated and working on that system. With static RAM, it doesn't need to be refreshed constantly, which makes it way more efficient. However, it's way more expensive, so we have to be sort of picky with where we use it. So we use it in these caches to help with faster access on the CPU. So with this, you should now have a better understanding of how the x86 architecture looks and how things generally work. As we continue to work with assembly processors and x86, you should have now a good understanding of where each thing um, plays its role and what's actually happening when we're executing our programs and instructions. So thank you for watching this video and I'll see you in the next one.